you find that with XML, data are machine readable. And if you use simple object access protocol, the uh, stand there's a standard format for representing arguments to a method and getting results back. Uh, with web service description language, you find that there's um, a way to describe what methods your server supports, what arguments they demand, and what they want back. Uh, we're not going to get into UDDI for the purposes of this course, but that would presumably mean registering your WSDL with a central registry so that people could ask, show me all the places that can give me a list of you know, environmental news, or show me all the places that can give me population statistics. The problems that we're looking at is called distributed computing. It starts with, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers by Thomas Watson. Uh, and that was 1943. So the interesting thing about this is that um, 10 years ago with the PC revolution, people thought this was an underestimate because there were now computers on every desk. Uh, it now appears that this may have been an overestimate by a factor of, uh, or by, uh, by four. He may have overestimated by four. So what does that mean? There's only one computer now, really. Unless you count, I guess, National Security Agency and the British Code Breaking Service and a few places that are on the, on the Internet. But if you buy into this services model, um, you basically have one large multiprocessor with kind of variable speed connections among them. Sometimes the computers are close to each other and very well connected. Sometimes they're far away and poorly connected. But basically, um, Thomas Watson was wrong but not in the direction that most people think if you look at the Internet as a distributed computing environment. Um, there's some blather here from Hal's old problem set. Uh, might, might be worth we reading. Okay, so what we're going to ask you guys to do, <laughs> fundamentally, is uh, build a Who's Online page. And you have seen this at photo.net, I think, assuming you're registered. We had some database problems last night, which was interesting. I published this. I got sick of the Globe presenting me as some loser who needed his old job back. So I published this little story on the website, which some of you may have seen. Um, and. Uh, it had been up for about four or five hours. It was getting quite a few comments from interested people worldwide. Aaron Schwartz, you remember him, the little punk? Oh, too bad that's on videotape. No, I love Aaron. <laughs> 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 to destroy that videotape. Um, and then Dave Weiner, oddly enough, because the two of them have uh, gotten along and not gotten along at various times. So this is an argument, actually. Right? They said, don't get into any, an argument with anybody who buys ink by the barrel. So not only am I publishing this, but if you go over to Dave Weiner's site, yeah, uh, pointer to a chapter of new book, yeah. So this is on scripting.com, which is one of the more hugely read places on the net by technical people. So I don't think this is making the VCs too happy now. Um, I take strong exception to Warnock's condition that Greylock is usually right. Greylock is rarely insightful, but always arrogant. <laughs> yeah, so everybody who hates Greylock in general Atlantic is now commenting on this page. And Pretty much all of their dark secrets are coming out. So they're not real happy about this. So the site was down. And of course, we thought, hey, those are digital assist admins must have gone into the F5 and reconfigured it, which would probably be a violation of the status quo order that the Delaware court has imposed on them. But who knows? So we went on the box, and we were all convinced that we have to move name servers for greenspun.com and STP all this stuff over to another server at MIT or somewhere. Uh, and we went down that path for almost an entire, probably two minutes. 
so we got completely focused on that path for two minutes. And then um, only then did we notice that one of the disk partitions was full. And that was where uh, Oracle was writing its archive redo log. So I was causing Oracle some major distress. So uh, we, it turned out to be an Oracle admin problem as usual for something broken on a site. Um, anyway, who's online? All right, so here's a human readable page. And we're going to ask you to build something like this, a little bit different in a way, because this one requires clicking through to get the email address. And we're going to ask you to produce the email address, um, user visible. Notice that to produce this page, you need to know who's been logged in, who's visited the site in the last uh, 600 seconds or so. So either you need some kind of session state that tells you who's around, or you need um, in your database a last visit column that you update on every visit. Um, we talked about that earlier, last visit versus second to last visit. For the purposes of building this kind of page, a simple last visit column and a filter in AOL server that uh, just issues a SQL update for every uh, visit will do just fine. So anyone who hasn't explicitly <coughs> logged out after a given point, you still consider logged out. Is that, is that right? So there is, yeah, there's, yeah, there's essentially no, I mean, on photo.net, you'd have to work so hard to find the logout page okay. that we assume yeah. that nobody will actually log out. They'll just abandon their session. Um, and even if you do have a logout page, there's no guarantee that they're going to log out. So, yeah, you want to look at uh, most recently visited. And they might still be around and using their computer, so for the purposes of this chapter. But this problem said it might still be the reasonable thing. All right, so Andrew says to modul modularize. So take the code out of that and put it into some kind of procedure that's callable. So that could be a C-sharp thing or AOL server tickle private library procedure. Um, OK. Um, add an n seconds parameter so you can query for users whose last visit was n seconds ago. OK, then we want you to make a SOAP response where you're producing first names, last name, and email. Now, it turns out this is going to be pretty easy for the .NETers because if you build a C sharp class that um, can be called with a n seconds parameter and that returns a data structure with three fields per um, record for each user, first names, last name, and email. You can just, I don't know, turn a switch or something and they'll generate all the SOAP stuff for you. So, because it was designed for that. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I've not used .NET enough, but I think it's pretty easy. There's a variety of articles I think you'll discover it somewhere on the Microsoft developer site. So anyway, that's what .NET is all about. So that makes it relatively easy. Um, for if you're dealing with um, AOL server, there's a tickle soap library here that loads into tickle 8.3. Um, make sure you're running the 8.3 tickle version of AOL server. Um, and then over here at Apache, there's some huge um, pile of Java that IBM started and that some people are finishing, I hope. <laughs> Added SSL support. So as you see, it's still quite new. They only added SSL in pretty recently. But yeah, added HTTP basic authentication. So basically, I guess this was only able to call open methods before. So now, presumably, it's able to go and call a server and supply a username and a password and so forth. Anyway, uh, so we provide pointers to some of this stuff. Make sure that by the end of today, you've at the very least read you know, the WSDL and the SOAP specs over the web consortium. I don't know. You can read the RS Digital Systems Journal article. It's kind of nice. Um, for a look at some competitive environments that we're not going to use, um, have a look at Sun Open Net also for your general te technical edification and talks with CTOs. You wanna, don't want to put forth the idea that um, 
soap is the only thing. There is this competitive thing from Sun. I think it's a relatively newer than soap, and I'm pretty sure that there's hardly anybody using it by comparison. And there's also this thing that actually Dave Weiner developed called XML RPC. And this is a simpler, somewhat simple. He, he was actually a contributor to the SOAP spec. I don't have a full understanding of, yeah, so he implemented this in 1998. That's a couple years before, or a year anyway, before Microsoft was pushing SOAP. Uh, so I think this is actually a mature, more mature environment in some ways. Uh, it's simpler than SOAP. Might not be quite as powerful in some ways. I don't know what SOAP is. It's a Simple Object Access Protocol. Um, well, it's an agreed upon format for specifying arguments and sp uh, representing results like arrays that come back from procedures when you're invoking a method from one physical computer to another by HTTP. And it happens to use XML to represent these data. So, um, you know, you don't need something like SOAP if you want to have a Java program call another Java program because there's some procedure call mechanism inside Java that lets you specify arguments and return results. Well, what happens if you have a Perl script calling a uh, C sharp program? Well, at that point you have, um, you know, the need for some kind of cross language uh, procedure call mechanism. Which, you know, if you're doing it on the same machine, again, you might come up with some binary format. Uh, but if you're doing this across two physical computers, then the idea now, I guess, the more modern idea, is to make everything printable. So once you say, I want a printable representation for structured data, as soon as anybody says that these days, then, you know, there's a huge chorus of, you know, yelping seals barking out XML, XML, XML. So they put it down into XML and... Uh, that's what SOAP is, ultimately. It's a way for a Perl script on one box to call you know, a Java program on another box um, and get a result back. So it's, a <coughs> it's certainly a lot of work for you know, what you could do within the Perl language you know, in one line without knowing anything. You could just you know, call the function, supply the arguments, get the result back, and you'd be happy. But you know, as soon as you say, I'm going to do it across language and on two separate machines on other sides of the Internet, now all of a sudden, you know, you need to bring in the CTO and all the machinery and choose between SOAP and XML RPC and Sun Net. What was that called? <laughs> Net One. <laughs> yeah, they're going to regret that name, I think. Open Net. Sun One. Open Net Environment. Yeah. I think Microsoft's going to beat them because. Um, in the news. Um, these guys <coughs> are not promoting Sun One to the web consortium. So they're saying, here's our standard. You should use it. And Microsoft has basically hid behind the web consortium for uh, purposes of pushing SOAP and WSTL out into the world. So. And they didn't put their name on it, right? It's not Microsoft Remote Procedure Call System. <laughs> it's Simple Object Access Protocol, a web consortium standard. It happens to have been written by a bunch of guys at Microsoft. Actually, a lot of those guys have quit, I believe. If you look at the committee, Don Box, then he used to work for Microsoft, but he now works at his own, well, this sort of training company called Developmentor. Uh, I guess these guys are still there. Dave is on the list. So the results that are returned in XML, how are the, the functions actually invoked across the machine? Um, how are the functions actually invoked? Well, you can have a look. This is why I'm asking you to read this stuff. Um, there are some pretty good examples in here. So here's a SOAP message. Um, asking to get the last trade price for the symbol DIS. I have no idea what that stock is. Oh, okay. 
Thank you. And then um, here's the response coming back in a soap envelope of 34.5 right, wrapped in a price tag. Um, so if you didn't have WSDL, you'd have to know in advance. You have to arrange by private agreement that you were going to supply the symbol argument and that you were going to get back a response called price. But with WSDL, there's a way to discover that automatically, that there is the stock quote um, message method available called get last trade price. And um, that uh, it takes one argument, and that argument should be a string, and the argument should be called symbol. Um, relation to XML, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it's worth reading. Uh, as you see from WSDL, which is a newer standard, March 15th this year. Uh, let's see, SOAP examples. .NET doesn't support this yet. They have, they use an, they have an older version, just SDL, I think they're called. Do, okay, so your, your beta 1 will only support SDL um, in a brainless fashion. So maybe this will level the playing field. The .NETers will actually have to write some code for a change, <laughs> along with the rest of you. Uh, they don't seem to have any examples on WSDL. I may try to show up myself to hear what Andrew has to say. All right, so basically this is something to look at over the next couple days. Um, try to get uh, your SOAP methods in there. <clears throat> Everyone in the class should be able to implement Who's Online everywhere. So basically once you take your Who's Online script and expose it, then it may becomes possible for anybody in the class to write a page that will show who's online on all the class servers. Because um, we did specify a uniform URL, slash services, slash who's online, so you know exactly where to go on your um, other machines, that the end seconds parameter is the one argument, and that first names, last name, and email are uh, the results. I guess you can assume that all of these are strings and that this is an integer. And Andrew gives you some examples of what a request. So you could actually cheat. You could just parse this with a regex coming in. Say, so I'm going to look for n seconds. <laughs> look, look for this and ignore everything else. Assume it's all well formed. Um, and then he gives you an example of the valid reply. As you see, this wouldn't be too hard to crack together in any computer language. Um, okay, then I think it'll be interesting to get who's what's new across content types. So you can get the five most recently added content items. Everything has a title, a body, first name, last name, and email of the person who posted, and a timestamp. What's new everywhere. So once you expose that, then Again, you can build a page that will show all the new content on all the class servers. That might be fun to see. And finally, um, you will expose WSDL contracts to the world. Um, oh, yeah, one more point. For who's online everywhere, um, you can eliminate duplicates by sorting on the email address, either uppercase or lowercase. There's an IETF standard that says that you're not allowed to have case sensitivity in an email address. So, you know, P, capital H, lowercase i, capital L, G, at MIT at edu is the same as all lowercase or all uppercase fill G at MIT at edu. So you can be sure that uh, email addresses, um, if they're capitalized differently, are in fact going to route the same through the world's email systems. So email address is a pretty reasonable key when you're dealing with foreign data. All right, I guess that's about it. Like I said, this is just a lecture at to introduce to you the existence of this chapter, which is getting fleshed out, but unfortunately right now mostly involves going and reading the SOAP spec, reading the WSDL spec, uh, finding some tools. The Tickle tools are quite cool. If you actually, for those of you who are Tickle wizards who will appreciate that Tickle SOAP thing, you can start up a Tickle interpreter. You can source the Tickle tools. 
and then you can start going out onto the internet and making SOAP requests and getting responses back and seeing how it all works right from your tickle shell. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any good way to do that in uh, Microsoft World. I think it's more painful. So um, that works pretty well. All right, questions? Don't ask me too much.